Colleen Mixon, um, and Nate Salrama. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Gail Gilman. I'm the Executive Director of the Community Housing Partnership. We have over 500 units supported by the LOSP program and 500 units that are supported by project-based Section 8. We are so excited that you're having this hearing today. Community Housing Partnership fundamentally thinks we should be having a discussion around the housing ladder. You're going to hear actually from many of our former tenants today who have successfully transitioned out of supportive housing. Um, I think it was um, other Supervisor Farrell or Mar who asked the question, what housing type are they going into? And while there's no formal tracking, we know anecdotally the number one place they're being placed is in, is in San Francisco Housing Authority units. You'll hear from families and single adults who successfully thrive there, paying only 30 percent of their income and can maintain their housing with less intensive services. I did also just want to add one other thing from the previous speakers. Um, as someone who's also a landlord, oftentimes tenants are served with papers to go to eviction for non-payment of rent. At Community Housing Partnership, we actually never evict anyone. We use that as a tool to enter into a conversation, to enter into stipulated agreements, to work out payment plans. Um, and so we have less than a 1% eviction rate, but we actually do use that as a tool for engagement, and I do think that's an important tool that sometimes we need um, to really have a tenant come forward and access services appropriately. I also would like to talk about two pilot programs that we're in conversations about to enhance the housing ladder. Um, Community Housing Partnership is in conversations with Hamilton Family Center around the fact that we have families living in our supportive housing who we know are stable and just need affordability and temporary rental subsidies. So we're negotiating placement into the rapid rehousing program of some of our families um, that have stabilized their income and stabilized in self-sufficiency. They would get access to those rapid rehousing slots and a two-year subsidy um, in a market rate apartment. We're really excited about this dialogue with Hamilton. Another conversation that we're having Go ahead, keep going. Um, it's with Mercy Housing California. So we have many tenants who have aged in place, who have reached a level um, where they need a higher level of care as a senior in their home. And while we would never dream of um, having those tenants leave our housing without an appropriate placement, Mercy, actually, Mercy Housing California actually operates housing in San Francisco with adult day services on site and a senior center on site. And we're in conversations with them to see if we could transfer some of our seniors into their properties, and then some of their tenants who maybe need more intensive services could transfer into ours. I, I really think if we're going to have an honest discussion about this, um, the three things that Olson Lee talked about are really key. Coordinated intake and assessment, um, Section 8, um, and movement within the system. I really feel that city departments um, will need to become unsiloed, that the sort of train of thought that these are DPH units or HSA units or someone else's units and they control these units, I think has to be um, something that is broken down, that is viewed as antiquated. And we should be looking at a system where people are placed, where, they, where their needs are met, where they can stabilize in housing, and where we can have the most cost-effective intervention and have movement throughout our system. And we really hope the Board of Supervisors will work to make that a reality. Ms. Gillen, quick question for you. I, I know CHP recently <coughs> talked about a, a plan to have 10 percent of your tenants have exits. Yeah. I think by 2020, that's what you want to, to be the model. I mean, can you talk about what you're doing internally? Because I think that's a great achievement, actually, as I started digging into this issue, I was surprised it's actually probably that low even, though, is even the possibilities. And, and when, you, when you look at it, though, I mean, seniors and people with disabilities understand why those numbers are so low. But that's, I think it's fantastic. I haven't heard that from anyone else, though. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing to achieve that? Sure. So Community Housing Partnership a year ago really thought long and hard about what our long-term outcomes should be as an organization and how we should be achieving excellence. And we... Um, did, you know, an anecdotal survey um, and realized that we think with the right case management model and the right staffing, which we're developing right now, that by 2020, 10 percent of our portfolio, so we're looking at about 100 households, could be transitioning yearly. We know for some of our folks, especially our folks living on Treasure Island, um, that they have options for portable vouchers after one year, and they've not been utilizing that option. They haven't had a self-sufficiency program on the island, so we're looking at that. Um, we're looking to target our 100 and like about roughly 150 family units to be the bulk of that move out. We're also looking to really focus on the over um, 66 um, TAY or opportunity youth that live in our housing. We don't think 
that a 22-year-old should move in to a housing unit and live there until they're 54. We think most of us from develop, like development, we move on, we get married, we have children, we have partners, we do all sorts of things, things that you cannot do in our housing because our occupancy is restricted. So really working with our youth for those exits and our families. And then our plan is in probably 2017 to roll that out to our single adults. Um, we're super excited about this, but um, it's also a blessing and a curse. So I know, you know there will be a hearing later today and other opportunities, but I just do need to know that community housing partnership is, is really saddened by the policy decision by the Human Services Agency to place all our non-placement units in Tier 1. We responded to the RFP clearly stating they should be in Tier 4. And actually everyone who will be speaking today from community housing partnership who has moved out has come from that housing stock. They actually have a much higher move out rate, and that's due to the services we have on site. And right now those services are slated to be cut in half. So we do really know that to be successful in this, we need deep, deep services. We need the workforce pro programming that CHP provides. But we also know that 1 to 75, uh, the caseload model, is, will not be sufficient, um, Supervisor Farrell, for us to reach this goal. Okay. Thank you very much. Supervisor Avalos. Yeah, thank you. Just in response, I mean, we had a good conversation last week about what are the best outcomes and providing the deeper subsidies, deeper services, I mean, uh, is really what uh, helps, especially around employment work. And so I, and it's every year it seems like we go through this discussion about how, what level of subsidies or what level of, of services we're going to have in our supportive housing sites in HSA. And uh, it, it seems to be moving counter to where what we're talking about and what the rest of the direction that the city wants to take around you know with DPH and other other supportive housing uh, providers um, so I just want to you know put it out there that I, I'm you know again kind of alarmed that there's a, a pushback on the model that you have been very successful in providing with your staff uh, to to people in your buildings and I'm hoping we can kind of reverse that trend and um, you know move it in the right direction so, yeah, supervisors, I think it's a resource question, and, you know, this was a policy decision from HSA. They're shifting resources. I think the master lease program is absolutely under-resourced. I actually think the solution would be increasing the baseline budget for HSA so that they have a larger pool of funds to work with, and they could all be funding their whole portfolio on a model that promotes move-out, that promotes work acti workforce activities, and promotes self-sufficiency. Um, so I know it probably wasn't an easy choice for them. I, I think non-placement is not a um, rational, data-driven reason to reduce services because they don't control placement. And I think that's the crux of the housing ladder argument, that placement should be irrelevant. It should be based on needs and self-sufficiency programming and how people can achieve the goal of moving out and being independent. Supervisor Mark. Yeah, I, I wanted to just ask Ms. Gilman, um, for information outside of the meeting on how um, CHP is successful in allowing a, an adult to age um, mm -hmm. to age in place and then transition to perhaps other more aging friendly housing like Mercy, um, I, I know that the population, as somebody raised single adult males being <clears throat> the, the main concern, but I know a lot of them will become from baby boomers to senior mm -hmm. seniors very, very soon, and unless we adjust for that. Um, with um, transitions to housing that's appropriate for people with disabilities and aging, um, we're going to have a, another crisis on our hands, I think. But thank you for the great recommendations and the, the charts and other things about the model that CHP has developed. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a handout for you as well about the Hamilton Community Housing Partnership model as well. Thank you, supervisors, for your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, Supervisors. My name is James Tracy. I work at Community Housing Partnership. Uh, my boss, Gail Gilman, covered most of, most of my points. I'll just hit on a few. Uh, I'm very proud to work at a place that has a 98.5% retention rate, which means that we are not the Freddy Kruegers of evictions uh, in, uh, in, uh, in subsidized housing. I put many years before I worked for uh, affordable housing, volunteering, doing eviction defense, working with HAP and EDC, uh, and uh, you know I've, we've seen the we've we've seen what what can what can happen. But why does CHP have a 98.5 percent uh, retention rate? 
it's not because we just fail to evict, right? It's not because we just look the other way when uh, around be behaviors. It's because there are services in our buildings that can uh, th that can support people when they are w when they are experiencing things in their lives that would get them evicted from other housing providers. And it's a very very important as over the 23 years that I've been in this community, I've seen people go from homelessness to many many different. Uh, uh, many different housing pr providers, and it's v it's a very very important that we d that the type of services are as robust in, in whether they go to master lease, whether they go to one of our buildings, whether they're at, at EC ECS. Everybody deserves the type of resources that will uh, help them move up the housing ladder. Thank you. Thanks very much. Next speaker, please.